everyone has their favorite story of times past when the salmon were plentiful in a nearby stream. Volume 1 of the Debunking the Mist series is dedicated to answering the question, where did all the salmon go? The video also offers an explanation of why the salmon are not coming back, even with all the dramatic changes in lifestyles, stricter development codes, revised logging and other commercial practices, and decades of habitat restoration projects. When tracking the modern history of salmon runs in the Pacific Northwest, it becomes readily apparent that the run volume and individual size of the salmon found in the rivers have declined sharply since Washington became the state. Increases in population, practices used in logging or agriculture, the diminished habitat quality, and industrial pollution will usually top the list of causes presented to the public. It makes sense until one realizes the salmon runs have continued to decline to this very day, even though fish-friendly practices that started to evolve nearly a century ago have resulted in dramatic improvements to the quality of our rivers and streams. Everything seems in place and ready to go, but the salmon runs continue to decline. To fully grasp what has happened, one has to go clear back to 1492 when Columbus first came ashore. North America and especially coastal regions of Washington, Oregon held large populations of Native Americans. They traveled up and down the coast between local rivers and salmon was a main provider of protein in their diet. The Indian population used canoes, spears, nets, and various forms of traps to catch the wild fish. Within a few short years of Columbus, and long before extensive European colonization began, the native population hit an all-time low, likely due to newly introduced diseases, which traveled much faster than the new settlers themselves. Since the reduced native populations equated to less harvesting, the salmon runs probably reached their peak a century later when explorer Juan de Fuca sailed into the strait named after him in 1592. The massive salmon runs were present 200 years later when on May 7, 1792, a Boston fur trader named Robert Gray crossed into the bay that would let her carry his name. They were still in place when the U.S. and Great Britain agreed upon a boundary for Canada, creating what is then the Washington Territory that contained Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. At this point, Hudson Bay Company and others did ship a limited amount of solid salmon to outside markets and they relied upon tribal fishers for supply. Tribal fishers were the commercial fisheries of that time. The native salmon runs were flourishing in 1855 when then territorial governor Isaac Stevenson set the stage for Washington to become a state by entering into treaties with the different tribes of the region. You see more on this subject in volume two of Debunking the Myth series which is dedicated to the controversial Bolt decision and other legal cases. As the native tribes were forcibly relocated to reservations and the majority of the river basin was turned over to the newly formed state government, the salmon runs were in a near perfect environment. Tribal and non-tribal fishers of the time caught all the salmon they wanted in any manner they chose without complicated fishing seasons and regulations. They either ate it fresh, salted some, or smoked it to preserve it into the winter months until the spring rivers filled the rivers with salmon once again. The regulatory factor was simply the local population, with the exception of a small amount of exported salted salmon, only caught enough for their own personal consumption, which did not overpower the river's ability to produce salmon. The balance between the returning adult salmon and their main predator, mankind, took a monumental shift when William and George Hoon, who had sold fresh and salted salmon from the Sacramento River in California since the 1850s, began the Pacific salmon canning industry near Sacramento in 1864. After two years, they found the Sacramento River runs insufficient to supply the cannery and moved it to the Columbia in search of more salmon. 
canned salmon was valued as a nutritious and inexpensive food for workers and their families. Northwest salmon quickly became popular and profitable, and canneries spread quickly throughout the region, including on the Bullapaw at Grace Harbor with this cannery in Aberdeen. The harvest reached a point where canned spring Chinook was selling on the East Coast for half the price of canned chicken. The cannery phenomena spread throughout Washington, including Puget Sound. At one point, there were over 50 canneries in Columbia alone, and 25 in Astoria that catered to commercial fishermen along the south coast of Washington. The sheer volume of salmon it required to keep these canneries operational was phenomenal. The canneries often imported laborers, creating an Asian ingredient to the local population. In a profit-motivated frenzy, the methods and gears of commercial fishing quickly changed as well to keep those cannery smokestacks belching. Giant fish wheels were installed to herd the salmon into a steam-powered wheel that scooped them out of the river or bay and dumped them in a barge. While they couldn't keep up with the wheel, the less efficient gill netters pulled nets ashore by hand or with a team of horses. Others used large boat-based net traps. Popular in Puget Sound, the Columbia and coastal estuaries, long purse seine nets from boats were used to capture salmon in huge quantities. Boats were popular. Historian Richard White noted that while one gill net's catch was small, a fleet of nearly 2,000 boats, quote, covered the river below Portland from Maine to August. Their nets formed a vast floating barrier to salmon 545 miles long by the late 1800s if connected and stretched in the end. By the time Governor Eliza P. Ferry was notified by Western Union Telegram on November 11, 1889 that Washington had been admitted to the Union, the salmon runs from Puget Sound down the coast and on up to Columbia were in grave jeopardy. By 1908, the lack of effective harvest restrictions had so decimated the Northwest salmon runs and so confused the regulatory efforts that the President of the United States proposed the federal government take action to do what the states apparently would not. In his State of the Union address to Congress, President Theodore Roosevelt said, the salmon fisheries of the Columbia River are now but a fraction of what they were 25 years ago and what they would be now if the United States government had taken complete charge of them by intervening between Oregon and Washington. During these 25 years, the fishermen of each state have naturally tried to take all they could get and the two legislatures have never been able to agree on joint action of any kind adequate in degree for the protection of the fisheries. For those of you that have become used to dams, logging, industrialization, and habitat destruction, topping the list of reasons for the demise of the salmon, it is important to note that at the time Teddy Roosevelt was sworn into office, old growth forests were still common, the industrial age had not yet gotten underway, Henry Ford had just introduced the Model A, and only dams that existed in the Pacific Northwest were those built by a beaver. No disguising it, over-harvesting was nearly singularly responsible for the demise. By 1889, the spring and summer Chinook that was the mainstay of commercial fishing were decimated. The canneries directed their gill netters and others to concentrate on coho, then sockeye, and finally chum. In a desperate move to keep the canneries operational, Washington State moved heavily into hatchery production in an attempt to compensate for the lack of salmon returning to spawn naturally in the rivers. In 1914, the old Chehalis hatchery up near PL led the way with more eggs harvested than any other hatchery in the state. It is important to note that the hatcheries, including the ones located in Chehalis Basin, were introduced with a single purpose, supply commercial fisheries with a reliable source of salmon. If a recreational fisher caught a hatchery fish along the way, so be it. As you witnessed earlier in the Creative Accounting series, it shows how up to 97% of the salmon available for harvest in the coastal estuaries end up in a commercial net. To this day, WDFW has remained loyal to that concept. 
The efforts to artificially enhance nature's production of salmon led to another field of commerce, fisheries management. The science of today had humble beginnings where just trying to peer into the water and count how many fish travel up a stream was considered advanced research. While riding in a helicopter surveying reds or salmon spawning nest has replaced sitting above a chute in a weir dam, counting returning fish or escapement as it's called is still a major component of fisheries management. We'll revisit this escapement subject shortly. Complicating matters even more for the spawning wild salmon, the logging and agricultural practices of the early days created major problems for the spawning grounds and other necessary habitat. Sawmills and other wood potted plants lined the banks of the Chehalis and the other rivers. Workers needed housing, so important wetlands near the estuaries were filled with sawdust to create towns such as Aberdeen and Hogan. All these practices modified the rivers and in doing so reduced nature's ability to produce salmon. As a result, native or wild spawning salmon and the coastal rivers continued to falter. The continuing decline of the salmon runs reduced volumes to the point where Northwest canneries could no longer underprice a Midwest poultry farm. However, as the canneries started to close down, another technological improvement rescued the commercial fishing fleets. Right behind electricity came refrigeration. Salmon that had previously had to be canned to reach Asia or the East Coast could now be shipped frozen. With the evolution of airplanes, a fish literally caught one day could be on the table in a fine restaurant thousands of miles away in a matter of hours. Salmon, once marketed in a can as a cheap source of protein, hit the big time as fresh or frozen salmon from the Northwest was then sold as a delicacy at top dollar prices throughout the world. With native stock supplemented by hatchery runs, the commercial fisheries continued to target adult salmon returning to the Shalis and other rivers. However, there were simply too many fishers for the amount of salmon remaining, which led to the first fish war, as different factions of commercial fishermen launched initiative drives and litigation to outlaw their competitors. Using horses to pull large seine nets to shore was banned. The gill netters convinced the public to pass an initiative banning stationary traps and fish wheels, first in Oregon and then in Washington in 1934. By the time the political fight was over, gill nets were the weapon of choice that would be used in the future to harvest salmon in fresh water. As technology changed, so did the gear used by commercial gill net fleets. By 1955, the introduction of synthetic nets made gill netters even more efficient harvesters than before. As commercial fishing gear continued to improve, Newer and higher producing state hatcheries quickly followed suit. Up until this point, local residents typically practiced substance fishing or fishing for survival and the goal was the same as picking wild blackberries. Recreational sport fishing for the fun of it expanded greatly after World War II. The Westport Charter Boat Association was founded in 1957 for the purpose of promoting charter boat fishing for salmon off Westport. In the mid-1970s, over 250,000 recreational fishers climbed onto one of the 200 charter boats operating out of Westport, catching nearly one half million salmon per year. At the same time, recreational fishers purchased thousands of private boats and pole fishers started to line the bank. With the decline of the salmon runs and limited harvest available, the number of charters operating out of Westport has declined by 85% down to approximately 30 boats today. Those that own their own boats often are disappointed to find them sitting in the driveway more weekends than they'd like. It is also important to note that this growth of recreational fishing created a new funnel of money into fishing game departments who had started selling licenses in ever-increasing volumes. These new license fees became a very important source of funding to cover the cost of half reproduction and fish management. FishingTheChalice.net intends to dedicate a series in the future to the licensed marketing practices that evolved within the department as it sought to increase license sales 
to add additional revenues needed to fund its activities. Throughout this entire time frame, the state of Washington had reserved nearly all the commercial fishing for non-tribal commercial fishing interests. When tribal fishers tried to catch salmon, the state impounded gear and prosecuted them effectively reserving all the commercial catch for non-Indian commercial fishers. By the 1970s, a second political and legal fishing war was again in full bloom as the treaty tribe members fought to get in on the fishing once again. A suit filed by the U.S. government against the state on behalf of the Quinaults and other coastal treaty tribes resulted in the controversial Bolt decision in 1974. The Bolt decision and other legal cases impacting fisheries management are going to be explored in Volume 2 of this series. Ironically, one of the findings is recreational fishers in a coastal stream governed by the Bolt decision are more likely to catch a salmon than a recreational fisher in a river where there are no treaty nets are allowed, and WDFW allocates the salmon in its sole discretion. Today, the commercial fisheries in the Chehalis Basin and Woolapaw is nearly exclusively gill nets. Specially designed boats lay out the drift nets in the bays of Lower Chehalis and Woolapaw. While the Willapa estuary is not covered by the Bolt decision and therefore void of tribal nets, a major component of the commercial fisheries in the Chehalis and Grace Harbor is conducted by the Quinault Indian Nation, or QIN as it's known. The QIN commercial fishery re-evolved following the Bolt decision affirming the treaty tribe's right to have the available harvest. The QIN fishers use gill nets. Some are set or stationary nets and Others are drift nets that are typically identical to other commercial fishers operating in the area. While some of the salmon are used for personal or ceremonial purposes, the salmon caught by the Quinault is typically shipped frozen, canned, smoked, and fresh to markets throughout the world. Returning to those hatcheries, the state's hatchery production steadily climbed following World War II and topped out in the late 1980s. At that point, funding and political support for the hatchery system started to fade as a concern grew that hatchery salmon were adversely impacting the natural spawning stocks. A WDFW presentation acquired by fishingshalis.net through a public document request shows how the hatchery production climbed steadily until 1990 when a statewide production started a slow gradual decline. The tributaries in Grace Harbor have also seen a dramatic decline in hatchery production in recent years. From 1990 to 2009, using coho as an example, we've watched as the plants going into the system from the hatcheries have declined from their high of nearly 2 million down to just about 900,000 by 2009. By the 2010 fishing season, local recreational fishers reported it was getting very difficult to catch a clip fin salmon in the Chehalis Basin. And WFW was requiring the dual spawners without a clip fin to be released, while many assumed the number of spawning salmon must be increasing. It was actually a decrease in the number of available hatchery fish that was making it difficult to retain a salmon. The reductions are continuing and the Chehalis Basin has been hit harder than any other region of the state. Available for viewing in the Fishy Leaks Library on fishingthechehalis.net, WDFW Director Phil Anderson writes QIN Fish Manager Ed Johnstone in 2011 to explain the reductions proposed for 2012. On page 3, Mr. Anderson includes a table showing how the rest of the state averaged reductions in hatchery production of approximately 8% during the last round of cuts in 2010, and he proposed to see another 3% in 2012. Meanwhile, the table shows the Chehalis Basin took a hit for 16% in 2010, and Andrew was proposing to a reduction of 19% for 2012. On March 13, 2012, the whole state turned its attention to the WDFW hatchery on the hump tulips.
cuts and other problems have landed a state hatchery in financial trouble. And as environmental specialist Gary Chittum reports, it's robbing part of the fishing future for a river and a town that share the same name. Pump tulips. The river and the town are connected in many ways, but mostly it's the salmon. Well, it's one of the most fish rivers in the state for its size. And uh, it's, it's a huge economic benefit. The state hatchery at Hump Tulips helps enhance the dwindling numbers of wild salmon. But there's a problem at the fish pens. We took a direct uh, budget reduction from the legislature coming into the current biennium. So it left us about $400,000 short for fish food. The state has hundreds of thousands of mouths to feed here and not enough money to feed them all. It looked like the fish were heading for disaster, but then the Quinault Indian tribe and a local fishing group pitched in to make sure that didn't happen. They pitched in money and volunteer labor, but still some 250,000 coho would not have a secure food future. So the state made a reluctant decision. And then we plan on uh, putting those fish in Duck Lake and Ocean Shores. Duck Lake is a picturesque feature of nearby Ocean Shores, but it's not where salmon belong. Is that what those fish were raised to do? Absolutely not. The fish will never reach the ocean, they'll never provide food for the ecosystem, and they'll never return to the hump tulips. Well, the state's losing all their investment, all the money that the taxpayers paid to raise these fish. The state of Washington's budget woes are playing out in many places, including along the banks of the hump tulips. In Hump Tulips, Gary Chittum, King 5 News. The state is continuing to negotiate with Indian tribes and private groups to help compensate for losses in state funding. As for the first half of the question, we now know what happened to all those hatchery salmon that were so prevalent in the Chehalis Basin in the 70s and 80s. Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife dramatically reduced their numbers by cutting back production from its hatcheries. That leaves us with the other half of the question. Why with all the fish friendly changes and lifestyles that have occurred in the basin, why have the wild or natural spawning salmon not increased in numbers to fill the void created by the reduction in hatchery plants? After all, a, a study published in 2001 by the Washington State Conservation Commission found the Chehalis Basin had fared better during the last 200 years than many other areas of the state. As an example, the study concluded the Estimated loss of estuary habitat is 30%, and this is to believe to be an underestimate. However, compared to other estuaries elsewhere in Washington State, this is a low level of loss. Let's return to the chart that showed WDFW only reduced the number of hatchery coho in the Shalis Basin after 1990. One would assume that the department would allow an increased number of wild spawning salmon to escape capture in the lower river to journey upstream and take advantage of the improvements occurring in the habitat at great public expense. If one tracks such an assumed increase in the natural spawners, it would show a gradual increase in contrast to the decrease of hatchery production. A fair assumption. After all, common sense dictates if one knowingly cuts back the artificially produced salmon side without allowing an increased number of natural spawners to escape upriver as compensation, the number of salmon returning in following years would drop sharply. While it is hard to accept, Review of the Excel spreadsheets used by WDFW to forecast and track coho returns to Grays Harbor and its tributaries in 2012 found the escapement goal, or the amount of adult salmon the harvest season set by the department intends to allow avoided capture, remained relatively unchanged. A grade school math class could have predicted all minuses and no pluses would result in a decline in the number of salmon in the river. Simply stated, it appears WDFW knowingly planned to have the number of salmon returning to the Chehalis Basin decline over time. Not a single recreational fisher we've contacted seems to remember WDFW disclosing this fact in any of its public relations and marketing campaigns encouraging local citizens to buy a fishing license. Now that we've answered the question about where all the hatchery and wild stocks have gone, 
Volume 2 of the Debunking Myths series will tackle the question of whether or not the controversial Bolt decision or other legal precedents somehow played a role in WDFW's decision to implement management plans that were designed to reduce the number of salmon returning each year to the Shehavis Basin. Volume 3 of the series tries to answer the question of whether or not the department really wants to see salmon spawning in this creek upstream. As everyone knows, if one wants to fill a basin, you have to let more in than goes out. Those viewers that invested time, energy, and capital in the habitat enhancement and lifestyle changes and are still waiting patiently to see salmon in their creek should be really interested in this one. For those concerned about the financial crisis our state is currently in, remember a recent court order has required the taxpayers to invest hundreds of millions into replacing aging culverts that have cut off salmon access to all those creeks over two centuries. If you have a potential funding source, please share it with us using the contact page. While you're at it, perhaps you'll be nice enough to share your prediction of how many salmon will ever see the inside of one of these expensive new culverts if WDFW refuses to raise its escapement goal, effectively blocking any more salmon from getting up past the 101 bridge in downtown Aberdeen.